almost 5,000 years ago. In the fertile soils of the Middle East, pagan religions prevailed in Mesopotamia. These pagans generated a number of myths and superstitions about the origin of life and the universe. One of these was the belief in evolution. According to the Sumerian Enuma Elish epic, life first appeared spontaneously in water, then evolving one species from another. Many years later, the myth of evolution found fertile ground in another pagan civilization, ancient Greece. Some Greek philosophers calling themselves materialists accepted only the existence of matter and counted matter as the original source of life. Consequently, they resorted to the myth of evolution inherited from the Sumerians to explain how living beings came into existence. Thus, ancient Greece became the junction point of materialist philosophy and the myth of evolution. The pagan Romans later cherished this heritage. These two concepts from idol-worshipping cultures were introduced to the modern world in the 18th century. Some European intellectuals, influenced by ancient Greek sources, who accordingly adopted materialism with one common belief. They were completely against the very idea of monotheistic religion. The book by the renowned materialist Baron de Holbach, The System of Nature, was considered the principal source of atheism. In this context, the French biologist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was the first person to give a detailed account of the theory of evolution. Lamarck's theory, which was later refuted, maintained that living beings evolved from one another through slight variations over time. It was Charles Darwin who repeated and popularized Lamarck's views, albeit in a slightly different form. Darwin revealed his views in England in 1859 through the publication of his book, The Origin of the Species. Darwin's book was in reality a detailed version of the evolution myth, originally introduced by the ancient Sumerians. His theory maintained that all the different species came from a common ancestor that appeared in water by chance, which every living species had sprung from over time again by chance. This assertion of Darwin was not based on clear scientific grounds and hence was not extensively adopted by the scientists of his time. Paleontologists in particular were aware that the entire theory was largely a figment of his imagination. The fossil record revealed that living things did not undergo an evolutionary process from primitive to the complex. Even the living things which lived hundreds of millions of years ago possessed the same complex structures of their counterparts living today. There was no trace of transitional forms that Darwin assumed to have existed and which were supposed to link one species to another. In the years to come, other assertions of the theory were refuted one after another. Biochemistry revealed that life was too complex to have emerged by chance as Darwin claimed. It was realized that even the random formation of the simplest protein molecule was impossible, let alone a living cell itself. 
Anatomy, on the other hand, showed that living beings had distinct designs and were created separately. In brief, Darwin's theory lacked a scientific basis. However, the theory was quick to gain political support since it did provide the so-called scientific basis for the dominant powers of the 19th century. In 1871, Darwin published another book, The Descent of Man, in which he claimed that man evolved from some ape-like creatures. Darwin was unable to provide any evidence supporting his claims, but clearly fabricated some imaginary scenarios. Darwin also embraced an interesting thought. He asserted that some races were more evolved and therefore more advanced than others, whilst other races, on the other hand, he considered still to be at the same level as the apes. There was another important aspect to Darwin's theory. He erected his entire theory on the concept of struggle for survival. According to him, a fierce conflict, a bloody struggle pervaded the natural world. The strong always won against the weak and thus ensured development. Darwin asserted that a similar conflict also held true for human races. Even the subtitle in his book, The Origin of the Species by Way of Natural Selection, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life explicitly reveals his racial views. According to Darwin, the favored race was the European white man. Asian or African races were quite simply failing in the struggle for survival. Darwin went one step further and even suggested that these races would finally be totally annihilated. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. As this statement explicitly reveals, Darwin was an out and out racist, believing in the superiority of the white man. He believed the white man would, in time, first enslave and then eradicate the so-called inferior races. Indeed, Darwin's ideas found fertile ground. In his time, the white man was already in search of a theory to justify his crimes. From the 16th century on, Europeans started to colonize various parts of the world. The first colonizers were the Spanish under the guidance of Christopher Columbus. In a short while, the Spanish conquistadors invaded South America, enslaving the native peoples who inherently had been a peaceful race. The provinces of South America, which were rich in gold and silver, were plundered by these invaders. The native people who resisted were slaughtered.
After the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and then the British took part in the competition for colonization. In the 19th century, Britain became the world's greatest colonial empire. From India to Latin America, the British Empire exploited the natural resources far and wide. White man was plundering the world for his own interests. Of course, these colonial powers did not want to be remembered throughout history as plunderers. So they have sought a means of justification for this exploitation. The justification was labeling the exploited people as primitive men, even possibly animal-like creatures. Such assertions were first put forward during the early period of colonization, the time when Christopher Columbus set sail for America. By claiming that the American native people were not real human beings, but a developed animal species, the Spanish colonizers sought to justify their enslavement. As it happened, this argument did not attract many advocates, since during that period, Europeans widely believed that humans were all created equal by God, and that all came from one common ancestor, the prophet Adam. However, things changed in the 19th century. As materialist doctrines flourished, people started to ignore the fact that human beings were created by God. This was also the birth of racism. The allegedly scientific basis of racism was Darwin's theory of evolution. Indian anthropologist Lalita Vidyarthi states, Darwin's theory of the survival of the fittest was warmly welcomed by the social scientists of the day, and they believed mankind had achieved various levels of evolution culminating in the white man's civilization. By the second half of the 19th century, racism was accepted as fact by the vast majority of Western scientists. With such racial views, Darwin provided solid support to the colonizing policies of the European powers. The imperialism of Victorian Britain chose Darwinian theory as its so-called scientific basis and justification. One of the most interesting examples of how the evolution theory offered inspiration to British imperialism was the scandal of the Piltdown Man. In 1912, a strange skull was dug up in Piltdown, England. Charles Dawson, the scientist who found the skull, together with his team, declared that it belonged to a creature that was half ape, half human. Arthur Keith, the famous evolution anatomist, examined the fossil and confirmed the results. However, Dawson and Keith emphasized an important point. The brain size of Piltdown Man was as big as that of modern man. The jawbone, however, had ape-like features. Suddenly, the brain of Piltdown Man became a source of great pride for the British. Since his skull was found in England, it surely had to be an ancestor of the British. The great size of the brain was supposed to indicate that the British had evolved to a higher status than the other races, thus in effect confirming that the British mind was superior. 
which is why the discovery of Piltdown Man aroused such great excitement in England. Newspapers ran headlines. In social circles, they joyously celebrated this discovery. The British government, for their part, honored Arthur Keith with a knighthood as acknowledgement for his work on the Piltdown Skull. The famous evolutionary paleontologist Johansson explains the relationship between Piltdown and British imperialism as follows. The Piltdown discovery was very Eurocentric. Not only did the brain have preeminence, but the English had preeminence. The inspiration the English derived from Piltdown Man lasted for 40 years. Then, in 1953, a scientist named Kenneth Oakley examined the fossil in detail and disclosed that it was, in fact, the greatest forgery of the 20th century. The fossil had been faked by attaching an orangutan jaw to a human skull. London Radio announced this fact in astonishment. Britain's August Natural History Museum is all a dither over a scandal concerning the Piltdown Man. One of the most famous fossil skulls in the world is declared to be in part a hoax. Forty years ago, its discovery was a sensation. Today comes the shocking news that this is skullduggery. For the evolutionists, the Piltdown Man scandal was only a beginning. In the coming years, other skulls were presented as proof of the ancestor of man. But later, each one of these proved to be either a fraud or a misinterpretation. It was determined that these skulls either belonged to extinct ape species or ancient human races. Despite this fact, evolutionists went even further and dared to present fossils of chimpanzees, orangutans, and even pigs as ancestors of man. Yet over time, they had to reject these fossils, to which they gave names such as Zinjanthropus, Ramapithecus, and Hesperopithecus. The story of Piltdown Man provides a symbolic indication of how British racism derives support from the theory of evolution. English imperialism had actually found more solid grounds to rely on. Nazism was born out of the political chaos that Germany experienced after the First World War. The leader of the Nazi party was Adolf Hitler, who had a highly ambitious and very aggressive nature. Hitler took an intensely racist standpoint. He firmly believed in the superiority of the German or Aryan race over the other races. His dream was that the German Aryan race would soon conquer the world and establish an empire that would last for a thousand years. Darwin's theory of evolution appeared to provide a scientific basis for Hitler's own racist theories. Hitler also derived ideological support from the works of Heinrich von Treitschke, the racist German historian. Treitschke was greatly influenced by Darwin's theory of evolution and based his own racist views on Darwinism. He said, nations can only evolve through a fierce struggle similar to Darwin's struggle for existence. Hitler also derived inspiration from Darwin's struggle for existence. The name of his famous book, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, 
was a mere expression of this Darwinist concept. Indeed, Hitler, just like Darwin, rated the non-European races as little more than apes and added, Take away the Nordic Germans and nothing remains but the dance of apes. The basis for the evolutionist views of the Nazis lay in the concept of eugenics. Eugenics meant the improving of the human race by weeding out sick and handicapped people and increasing the number of healthy individuals. According to the theory of eugenics, the human race could be improved in the same way that better kinds of animals can be bred by mating healthy specimens. As might be expected, the eugenicists were simply the Darwinists. At the head of the eugenics movement in England came Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, and his son, Leonard Darwin. It was evident that the theory of eugenics was a natural consequence of Darwinism. This fact is also made very clear in publications that promote this dubious science. To quote but one, eugenics is the self-regulation of one's own evolution. The first advocator and promoter of eugenics in Germany was Ernst Haeckel, the famous evolutionary biologist. He advanced the theory of recapitulation, which proposed that embryos of different species resembled one another. It was later realized that Haeckel made forgeries in the drawings that he used to propagate his assertion. Haeckel falsified his drawings in order to show fish, human, and chicken embryos were similar to one another. Some parts of the embryos he removed and others he distorted. Even Haeckel himself later confessed that his drawings were works of forgery. However, evolutionist circles turned a blind eye to the forgery just to sustain the theory. While producing scientific forgeries, Haeckel also spread the eugenics propaganda. He suggested that disabled newborn babies should be killed as soon as possible in order to speed up the process of evolution in society. He went further and proposed that disabled, mentally retarded, and the genetically sick should be killed off right away. Otherwise, Haeckel argued, these people would place a burden on society and slow down evolution. Haeckel died in 1919, but the Nazis inherited his cruel ideas. A short while after Hitler seized power, he launched an official eugenics policy. The mentally retarded, the disabled and those having hereditary diseases were collected in special sterilization centers. These people were considered parasites who posed a threat to the purity of the German race and hindered the progress of evolution. Indeed, in a short time, these isolated people started to be murdered at Hitler's secret command. In his effort to speed up the so-called evolution of the German race, Hitler murdered many people. 
Meanwhile, he pursued another requirement of eugenics. Young men and women with blonde hair and blue eyes, considered typical specimens of the pure German race, were encouraged to have sexual relations with one another. In 1935, special reproduction farms were established. SS officers frequently visited these farms where young women who met the Aryan criteria had been housed. The illegitimate babies born on these farms were to become the future soldiers of the German Reich. In order to improve the so-called superiority of the Aryan race, Nazis were resorting to Darwinian concepts. Darwin had suggested that the size of the human skull increased as he climbed the evolutionary ladder. The Nazis embraced this idea fiercely and set about taking skull measurements to show that the German race was superior. In all corners of Nazi Germany, comparisons were made showing that German skulls were larger than those of other races. Traits like teeth, eyes, hair were evaluated according to the evolutionist criteria. Individuals whose measurements were found to be contrary to official German race specifications would be annihilated according to the Nazi eugenics policy. All these outlandish principles were applied in the name of Darwinism. Michael Grodin, the American historian and the writer of the book The Nazi Doctors and the Nuremberg Code, states this fact. Is that there was a perfect meshing of Nazi ideology uh, and social Darwinism and racial hygiene as it developed at the turn of the century. That physicians had a notion that there was social deviance and there was behavioral deviance that somehow was genetically linked and there was good genes and bad genes. And so this social Darwinism, which by the way was around the world, and the Nazi physicians pointed to the US is where they learned a lot of the racial hygiene. George Stein, the American researcher, explains this subject in American Scientist magazine. National Socialism, whatever else it may have been, was ultimately the first fully self-conscious attempt to organize a political community on a basis of an explicit biopolicy, a biopolicy fully congruent with the scientific facts of the Darwinian revolution. Sir Arthur Keith, the famous evolutionist, commented about Hitler. The German Führer is an evolutionist. He has consciously sought to make the practice of German policy conform to the theory of evolution. Another important reason for Hitler's evolutionism is the fact that he saw the theory as a weapon against religious beliefs. Hitler had a deep-rooted hatred of monotheistic faith. Religious virtues like love, mercy and modesty were a great hindrance to the merciless and militaristic Aryan race model. That is why, from the time the Nazis seized power in 1933, they aimed for a return to ancient pagan religion for German society. The swastika, being a symbol originating in pagan cultures, became a symbol of this transformation. Nazi ceremonies held in every corner of Germany were in fact reconstructions of ancient pagan rites. As mentioned before, the theory of evolution itself was a heritage from pagan cultures. So here we see the inextricable links between paganism, Darwinism and Nazism. At the root of all the murders committed by the Nazis lay this pagan culture. The Nazis revitalized the savage pagan culture and received solid support from Darwin's atheist theory to legitimize it. The reality is, however, that cruelty, murder and corruption on earth are strictly forbidden and condemned by religion. 
God summons people to justice, compassion, and modesty. Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator and one of Hitler's great allies, was also inspired by the theory of evolution. In his youth, he wrote articles which portrayed Darwin as the greatest scientist ever. After coming into power, his fascist Italy occupied Ethiopia. He justified his occupation of Ethiopia with Darwin's racist views and the concept of the struggle for survival. According to Mussolini, Ethiopians were inferior because they were of the black race. And being governed by a superior race like the Italians should have been a natural consequence of evolution. Mussolini was also seized by the thought that nations evolved through war. For Mussolini, the reluctance of England to engage in a war only proved the evolutionary decadence of the British Empire. Eventually, the Nazi Empire lost the Second World War and went down in history as having murdered millions of innocent people. Mussolini, on the other hand, was executed by his own people. Yet still, Darwinist thought, which provided the foundation for Nazi ideology, has persisted. The notion suggesting that humanity is exalted through struggle and violence was actually the source of another ideology which on the surface appeared to be entirely different from Nazism. Materialist philosophy which was born in ancient Greece, enjoyed a victory in the 19th century. This ancient philosophy owed its success to the two German philosophers, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Marx and Engels tried to explain the materialist philosophy, which had survived through the ages, in terms of a new method called dialectics. Put briefly, dialectics was the assumption that all development in the universe was a consequence of competitive and self-interested conflict between opposing forces. Marx and Engels used dialectics to explain the whole of world history. Marx's simplistic analysis suggested that the history of humanity was based on conflict and that the current conflict was between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. He predicted that individual workers would come to realize that their only hope was to unite and stage a revolution. Both Marx and Engels had a profound hatred of religion. As confirmed atheists, they insisted that the eradication of religion was necessary for the success of communism. Round about the time that Marx and Engels were formulating these ideas, there was a significant development which could serve to support their theories. Darwin came on the scene with his book, The Origin of the Species. 
Darwin proposed that in the world of biology, living beings evolved and survived as a result of a struggle for existence. What was this if not dialectics? Furthermore, this was a dialectics that appeared to deny religion any role, including the existence of creation or a creator. This was an exceptional opportunity for Marx and Engels. Engels read Darwin's book as soon as it was published and wrote to Marx. Darwin, whom I am just now reading, is splendid. In response, Marx replied, This is the book which contains the basis in natural history for our view. Engels was so much influenced by Darwin's theory that, in an effort to contribute to the theory, he wrote an article titled The Part Played by Labor in the Transition from Ape to Man. Soon Engels compiled all his evolutionist ideas in a book, Dialectics of Nature. The views of Marx and Engels flourished, especially after their deaths. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin was the first to start putting the communist revolution Marx dreamed of into practice. Lenin was the leader of the communist Bolshevik movement in Russia. At that time, the Tsarist regime in reign was ruled by the Romanov dynasty. The Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, had been looking to get rid of the Tsarist regime by force. The confusion caused by World War I offered the opportunity that the Bolsheviks so wanted. In October 1917, they seized power. After the revolution, Russia became the scene of a bloody civil war between the communists and the adherents of the Tsar. Everyone considered rivals by the communists, including the Romanov family, were brutally killed. Like his mentors, Marx and Engels, Lenin was also a fervent evolutionist and frequently stressed that Darwin's theory was the basis of the dialectic materialist philosophy he advocated. Trotsky, the second important name in Bolshevik revolution, also attached much importance to Darwinism. He expressed his enthusiasm for Darwin thus. Darwin's discovery is the highest triumph of the dialectic in the whole field of organic matter. Joseph Stalin, one of the cruelest communist dictators, succeeded Lenin in 1924. Studying Stalin's 30-year reign of terror, one could almost say that his overall intention was to prove the cruelty of communism. One of his first actions was the collectivization of land. He used armed force to make the peasants, who made up 80% of the population, amalgamate their holdings into vast state and collective farms. Grain was harvested by armed troops. Famine swept the land, killing men, women and children. But Stalin continued to export grain stocks rather than feed his people. It's calculated that some 10 million peasants perished during these early years. Six million died of famine in the Ukraine. Twenty percent of the population of Kazakhstan disappeared. 
In Caucasia alone, the death toll was one million. Stalin sent hundreds of thousands of people who resisted his policies to labor camps in Siberia. These camps, where the prisoners were worked to death, became a grave for most of these people. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of people were executed by Stalin's secret police. And in the Crimea and Turkestan regions, millions of people were also forced to emigrate to remote corners of the Soviet Union. As a result of Stalin's bloodthirsty policies, more than 30 million people were killed. According to historians, Stalin derived a special pleasure from this violence. In his office in the Kremlin Palace, he enjoyed examining lists of people executed and murdered. Besides his psychological condition, the factor making Stalin such a merciless mass murderer was his deep-rooted belief in materialist philosophy. And the basis of this philosophy, in Stalin's interpretation, was Darwin's theory of evolution. He said, There are three things that we had to do to disabuse the minds of our seminary students we had to teach them the age of the earth, the geologic origin, and Darwin's teachings. Another indication of Stalin's blind attachment to the theory of evolution was the outright rejection by the Soviet education system of Mendel's laws of genetics. From the early 20th century, Mendel's laws had been accepted by the scientific community but not in the Soviet Union. They invalidated Lamarck's claim, also partly accepted by Darwin, regarding the transmission of acquired traits to succeeding generations. The Russian scientist Lysenko saw this as a heavy blow to the theory of evolution and developed a Lamarckist alternative. Stalin was impressed by Lysenko's ideas and made him head of the official scientific institutions until Stalin's death, the science of genetics was not accepted in the scientific institutions of the Soviet Union. During the totalitarian rule of Stalin, another communist regime underpinned by Darwinism was established in China. In 1949, after a long civil war, the communists won power under Mao Zedong's leadership. Mao established a bloody and repressive regime as had his ally Stalin, who now provided him with support. Countless political executions took place in China. Nearly 30 million people died because of the horrible famine which resulted from Mao's insane policies. During the years of Cultural Revolution, the young militants called Mao's Red Guards threw the country into a state of utter chaos and fear. Mao explained the philosophical basis of his regime by explicitly stating that Chinese socialism is founded upon Darwin's theory of evolution. Harvard University historian James Reed Pusey also acknowledges the Darwinist influence on Maoism. In his book entitled China and Charles Darwin, Pusey states, Darwin had legitimized violent change and revolution. Surely that was one of the most momentous things Darwin did to China. And the thinking of Mao Zedong fit perfectly. Communism has caused terror, guerrilla war, and civil wars in many countries. 
In Cambodia, the communist Khmer Rouge slaughtered nearly one third of the country's population. People were killed only because they took a few grains from the collective farms or they said a word inconsistent with communism. The remnants of the Cambodian massacres clearly display the horror of communism without any further need for words. For 150 years, the communist ideology closely allied with strife and war has been intertwined with Darwinism. Today, Marxists and communists are still the foremost advocates of Darwinism. In almost any country, the most enthusiastic advocates of the theory of evolution tend to be Marxists. That is quite simply because, as Karl Marx himself said, the theory of evolution contains the basis in natural history for his materialist ideology. Darwinism was advanced 150 years ago. Since then, its dark legacy to humanity has been a turmoil of brutal dictators. Racism, torture, persecution, and war. This is the natural consequence the attitudes of both Darwinism and materialism have towards mankind. It is inevitable that this combined philosophy that regards human beings as no more than animal species puts its faith in matter alone and maintains that conflict is the unchanging law of nature will dehumanize individuals and brutalize societies. And the real reason for all this is man's denial of his own creator. A society turning its back on God and being carried away by dogmas like materialism becomes prone to all forms of degeneration. Consequently, it inevitably faces pain, fear, and destruction. Peace, justice, and security can be attained only when Darwinism and materialism are exposed to the world as the deceptions they really are. And when man knows the purpose of his creation, that purpose is to turn to one's creator, to turn to God.